Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Very warm welcome. This is a very, very unique program this evening. Uh, we keep doing so many management events here, but this is very different. This is about a seminar on Water Futures, Tamil Nadu Pathways for Sustainable Development. So we will come to this a little later. Today, uh, I'll just talk about two or three and then we will start in one minute. So one is in the month of October and November, a lot of events. Um, have been, uh, been lined up after the puja holidays. So we have a lot of holidays coming up during puja and thereafter Diwali. So you have catered uh, for, for these kind of holidays so that you can enjoy with your families and then have some events only scheduled in between. Some very important of them, I will just uh, tell you that on the 21st of October, we are having this uh, book reading session which we call the Read and Grow here. Uh, that is on Success Principles by Jack Canfield. Uh, wonderful book, uh, bestseller. I hope many of you will join us that day. You will get a mail, you will get all the details of the speakers. 22nd of October, uh, a flagship event which we do every year. Kevin Care, Chini Krishna and Innovation Award. Once again, you will get the information uh, soon. Uh, the event will be happening this time at the IIT Research Park Auditorium uh, instead of Kamaraja Rarangam because that is under renovation. So, once again, uh, three best innovators from all over the country have been selected. And uh, they will be given the award on the 22nd evening followed by a dinner. So, uh, people who have um, not yet registered, you could kindly block your diary. You will get all the other details a little later. On the 8th of November, uh, we have uh, Mr. Muthu, who, the Managing Director of uh, Idayam Nalanai. He will be coming here. He will be talking to us on this series called The Pride of Tamil Nadu. So once again, you will be uh, getting all the details very soon. Uh, who will be uh, interacting with him and things like that. <clears throat> so, with these two, three very important announcements and so many other programs, I hope many of you are aware that every third Friday, like we are having this session here at MMA on the, called Read and Grow, taking a book. Every last Saturday, we have an event at the Indian Institute of Foundrymen, which is in Ananaga. So, that's a, once again a management program in the evening, uh, 6 o'clock, sorry, 6.45 to 8, followed by dinner. So, it's, you can block your diaries every month, last Saturday that will happen. And similarly, third Wednesday of every month, we are having one program at the uh, R. Bhupati & Co. This is mostly on finance. It could be on personal finance, it could be on uh, corporate finance, but very, very interesting subjects. Like last month, we did it on PF, ESI and things like that. So, what will be the uh, theme for this month, I will let you know. So, these are some programs which, can block, which you can straight away block your calendar, third Wednesday, third Friday last Saturday and things like that. So, rest of the days, we will keep informing you about the program that's coming up. Right. So, without further ado, let me now invite to this, uh, invite to the dais, Mr. Satyamurthy. So, please, may I request you to also escort the two speakers of the day today, Professor S. Janaki Raman, PhD, and Dr. V. Tirupuhar, PhD, IAS. Sir, may I, audience, may I request you to welcome them with a round of applause. Thank you, sir. Please come. Please take your seat on the dais. Yeah. Oh, Janagar. So, I also welcome uh, the participants who joined us online today. Like every other program, this program is also webcast live. And I know we have a very, very dedicated audience who follow us online as well. So, as usual, you could send in your uh, questions on the number displayed on our uh, YouTube channel uh, on Live IBC. And we will take your questions at the end of this program. So, with these words, let me now briefly introduce the guest speakers of the day. Mr. Satyamurthy, of course, doesn't need any introduction to the MMA audience. He's a, he's one of our support. He's a pillars of the uh, MMA 
when it comes to kind programs like these the strategy uh, sustainable development and such kind of things economy we have been doing so many programs with mr sachamurthy as you are all aware currently he is the convener policy matters chennai he is a distinguished fellow and head of orf chennai initiative earlier sachamurthy uh, has worked with several newspapers in india both in english and local languages he was the editorial advisor at the trilingual tv group in sri lanka as well and he was based in colombo between 2005 and 2006 this brief introduction sir thank you once again for choosing mma to host this program then we have professor s janakarajan president south asia consortium for interdisciplinary water resources studies which is based out of hyderabad at present the president sesi waters hyderabad dr janakiraj janakarajan holds a phd in economics from the university of madras obtained through mds where he was the past director he did his post doctoral at cornell university and was a visiting professional international development center QEH Oxford University his key areas of research include urban and rural water water markets water conflicts trans border boundary water disputes climate changes and others so i think people here in chennai should be very very interested about this theme because we either get floods or we get floods sorry floods or we get a drought alternate year so i think we should know the reason why that happens to us in chennai and there are so many studies which care us with the kind of results that you know water level at the uh, marina is raining along the coast is rising and uh, so many uh, areas along the water along the coast may get inundated in a few years from now so let's listen more about this from professor janakarajan and to to speak to us along with him today we have dr tirupugal phd ias is retired of course is a former additional secretary national disaster management authority government of india thank you so much sir for joining us this evening and holding a phd from australian national university canberra dr tirupugal retired as a senior member of the indian administrative service and additional secretary in ndma he played a very very important role in fixing major gaps in the disaster management bill of 2005 and also served at the center and earlier in the native gujarat cadre in matters of disaster At present, Dr. Tripugar heads the Chennai Metro Flood Management Committee appointed by the government of Tamil Nadu in 2021. I think many of you would be aware that these days the NDRF has been so active, and uh, we saw the recent uh, problems Pakistan had. Fortunately, we have the NDRF to save us from these kind of griefs, and I'm sure people like Dr. Tripugar are playing a very, very major role, a stellar role in making the NDRF what it is today. and may be more powerful in future so with these words may i now invite mr satyamurthy to come and deliver the opening remarks good evening everybody and thank you for your presence here and the title says it all and come october november we are in chennai not in chennai this past decade plus the rest of tamil nadu is also facing flood related disasters and of course in summer as has been said even in sangam literature it is a drought era here there again there is a certain management that has to be handled by the government of the day recently rather i think it was in the last week that we had a news report that said that 29% or close to a third of uh, uh, the sink coastal areas in the country will be inundated in next 5 years of course in 2018 19 we had other reports saying that by 2020 all the ground water in 21 major cities including chennai delhi bombay and bangalore will be exhausted thankfully that did not happen or at least but still we are very close to that any day any time like with this inundation of course it is not just human uh, effort to take us there there are natural causes etc but the human contribution to this in the form of uh, uh, carbon etc etc i am not going to scientific part of it because 
there are speakers who will be handling those things, is no less. With the result, there are issues and issues and solutions that are being talked about. But not all of them are implemented regularly or consistently. Come flood season. Tamil Nadu, and particularly Chennai city over the last decade in particular, goes up on a hype saying this is not there, that is not there. But even as citizens, we don't take note of it when we should be doing it. Today I am told that the chief minister visited across, I mean, to the city to find the flood mitigation levels, flood management levels for the coming uh, Northeast monsoon. I don't know what they found. Maybe the news reports the coming days will say that. But travel across the city everywhere, the roads are dug up. There is not minimum coordination between departments. I think I am told that the electricity board has done it this time. The corporation wants to stop it, but corporation doesn't know how to do it. Minimum coordination can happen. And we all keep jumping the uh, dug up places without doing anything about it. This is as far as the common man is concerned. And overall, there are policy formulations that has to be formulated, policies have to be formulated and implemented where we have to cooperate. During the floods, for instance, the last 10 years, more than two or three have happened. Floods, cyclones. Every time it happened, what do we say? Our uh, water table has been uh, destroyed. Our tanks have been filled by homes, houses. How many of you have purchased houses in there? Didn't you know that your flat or apartment or house was built on that kind of uh, land? The paddy field, farm, invariably lakes. But we will stand outside that house and complain that the government has not done about it. This government may be inefficient. Politicians and bureaucrats may be corrupt. But are we contributing to the same? And still blaming the rest. We get politicians that we deserve. They are one of us. Right? If I have chosen a different career, I might have been a politician or a minister. You, any of us can be. So there is something that we have to do it. But of course, the seminar is not about it. It is about more serious things. Right? And we have been lucky to have two speakers who are, one is the chair of the Cor Madras Corporation panel, another is a member of the panel, and both Dr. Janagarajan and Dr. Tirupugaj, they are extremely qualified people to speak about these things. Between them, Dr. Janagarajan has got a lot of field experience, particularly people who have been coming to our hour of sessions. And of course, he's also, uh, in the last few years, well known to TV viewers in Tamil Nadu and newspaper readers across the country. About whenever it comes to water management, irrigation management, etc. And of course, Dr. Tirupugar has a vast experience, as the TV says, in administrative matters also, regarding disaster management. With that brief introduction, I invite Dr. Janakarajan to open the evening session. Okay. 
Hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks, uh, Satyamurthy, for uh, a nice introduction. I should thank uh, MMA for this opportunity to make this presentation. And, uh, and actually, I'm not going to talk about the floods, Chennai floods or uh, whatever problem that are very specific to you know Chennai or Tamil Nadu. And I will, I, will, I will give you examples about that. But then, you know, actually speaking, in the last, uh, you know, few years, last two, three years, I have stopped talking about these issues in isolation. Because our issues are much, much bigger. Much, much bigger and it's a global. So, uh, what I want to really present to you today is to talk about those macro issues, global issues, and then how it is really related to these micro issues that you are talking about, Chennai flood or whatever. So, I'm going to really focus more on what is our biosphere, what is the condition of our biosphere, where do we live, and in that connection, we also will talk about the water futures and what are the pathways for sustainable development. I, there are three phrases I added there. One is know more to act, learn more, listen more, understand more to act. Second, no more neglect. We are neglected for so long and no more neglect. And finally, I also would like to caution you, don't hide behind climate change for all human blunders. These are the three important phrases I would like to put forward to you before I make the presentation. Now let's see what this biosphere is all about. When we say biosphere, it includes three. One is the lithosphere, which means basically one, talk, one is talking about the land mass. The second one is about the hydrosphere. Hydrosphere talks about the water. And third is the atmosphere. Primarily, you know, it, it's a cover on the planet Earth where you, where you really get, uh, you know, the monsoon conditions and the, the way the hydrological fire cycle functions and so on. So these three are, do not act in isolation and they are very much and very closely interrelated. Now, if you look at the lithosphere and in the look at the Earth's landmass, Within the available landmass, you all know that you know the two thirds, as as sorry, the the the, the two, two, one one third is covered with the wetland. I mean, total of the total uh, uh, earth, we got about one one fourth, uh, one third is the landmass, and within that one third, we got about one third is covered with the water. The rest is land, and we have that water wetland distributed over lakes, rivers, marshes, estuaries, creeks, river mouths, and so on. Now, despite that landmass covered with water, why are we suffering from for want of water? This is fresh water. And secondly, the wetlands are extremely important and they are world's most essential and valuable ecosystems contributing to climate regulation, water, food and fiber, biodiversity, and most importantly, sustenance of our life system living on the landmass. So, the, in, the, in, in, in the lithosphere, we are talking about the land, as well as the fresh water. But both are in scarcity and both are de de decreasing in supply. And they are, they, when they, they are you know, in, in, in fact, available, uh, extreme, used more and more and available less and less for all productive purposes. Why? Why is that happening and how are you going to survive is a very, very critical issue that we need to ask. If there is going to be a reduction in the supply of fresh water and reduction in the land, how is that? going to be very helpful or unhelpful for any uh, development, the path of development that we are talking about, how to manage it. And secondly, you know, we, the atmosphere is actually very heavily stressed and you know that four or five layers of atmosphere and it, it helps to really, uh, you know, uh, protect all the living organisms from genetic damage and so on. And unfortunately, the atmospheric system itself is in a great danger and there are scientists who predict that there may be atmospheric collapse in the course of uh, another 40, 50 years, which means there is going to be a huge problem in terms of, uh, you know, you know, access to, uh, gaining access to oxygen and so on. So, atmosphere is in great danger thanks to uh, uh, all emissions that you are making. Now, hydrosphere is uh, something which you all know very well, I don't have to explain to you. And that, uh, you know, um, um, easily, you know, we have got about 97.5% uh, of water is, is a full of uh, so sea water and that water is now saline and so people say you cannot use the water but how about the uh, another two five and five percent of the water that we have 
In the 2.5 percent of the water, also, you know, uh, something like, uh, you know, um, uh, 1.5 percent lies in the form of ice in the North and South Pole, and we are left with only 1 percent of the total water. And in that 1 percent of the water, also roughly 50 percent lies below the ground and 50 percent on the surface. And the water that lies on the surface is also polluted. So you see the problem with the hydrosphere. So that we don't have the water, we do have the water. It's available in the form of ice or in the, or in the form of a, a subsurface or in the form of a, a, a polluted, uh, uh, um, uh, with a lot of pollutants. So how is that going to be very helpful? This is a context also we need to talk about the prospects of the blue economy. The prospects of the blue economy is withering. That is something which is extremely important we need to talk about. When you say the blue economy, blue economy encompasses both the seawater as well as the fresh water. Both are in a very serious problem. Now, how are we going to manage? Whenever we talk about the blue economy, we only talk about the uh, economic aspects of it, how the marine trade could be, you know, uh, you know uh, in, 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 in enlarged, uh, how seawater could be used for uh, other purposes, how water can be used for uh, any um, 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 market activity, commercial activity, industrial activity, and so on and so forth. But then nobody really talks about the basic function of these water resources. Basically, the basic functions of the water resources, most important is the climate regulation. Nobody talks about it. What is the value of the water for climate regulation? What is the value of water in that, for instance, the ocean, ocean generates 50% of the oxygen that you need. Ocean generates 50% of the oxygen that you generate, I mean, that you need. But anybody talk about it? What is the value of that uh, oxygen that, that, is, uh, that, that is generated from uh, the ocean. So the blue economy is in great danger and that is what is all about hydrosphere. Now, what is the condition of our biosphere today? What is going to be the future of bio, um, uh, biosphere is something which we need, which we all need to worry about and uh, this basically it's because of the man's greed and power that it destroys and that, uh, the, 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 that, uh, that uh, des 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 destroys the earth and also poses a huge threat. Now let's look at India's basic land and water, strat water statistics. If you look at the water statistics in India today, something like a, you know, this is available statistics, a very, you all very, very, well know, very, very well known figure. We have got a, something like a 4,000 billion cubic meters of water available. That's all available in India. And that's about 141,000 TMC feet, if you want to know it in TMC feet. Now, although India occupies, it's a very important statistics, although India occupies 3.29 square kilometers geography of a geographical area. Now we are supporting 15 percent of the world population. The geographical area that we have under our control is something like uh, you know 2.4 percent of the total land land area in the world. In the, but then we have to support 15 percent of the total world population. Not that we also have to manage hell of a lot of our livestock population. India is a place where. There is a largest stock of the livestock. We got the largest livestock in the world, and something like a 500 million plus. And each one of these cows, buffaloes, uh, uh, goats, and so on, and chicken needs a lot of water. If you look at the virtual water to generate one kilogram of uh, beef, you need 5,000 or 50,000 liters of water. To to have one kilogram of beef, you need 50,000 liters of water. That you then you calculate how much water that you need to really rear this many livestock population. But unfortunately, India's per capita surface water availability is declining. If you calculate it from 1991 onwards, it has come down from 2003 to it has come down something like 1,191 and it is likely to go down further in the course of the next 30, 40 years because of the population raise and also increasing demand. Now let's look at basic statistics related to Tamil Nadu. Available surface water in the state is 17.5 billion cubic meters, 618 teams of it. This is, this is what the available data shows. That's all the uh, data, the, the, the water that we have uh, under our um, control. And groundwater availability is 15.3 billion cubic meters, that is 540 teams of it. The per capita water availability is much less compared to even what uh, uh, what's available at uh, all India level. And compared to the global level, Tamil Nadu's per capita water availability is extremely low. It is something like 900 cubic meters, and the latest data shows it is something like 825 cubic meters you know, per capita, which is extremely less. 
there are 17 river basins. And on record, there are 61 major reservoirs, 39,200 irrigation tanks, about 3.0 million wells in this state. We got so many, so, so many source of water. But if you ask me whether these reservoirs are in good condition, whether there are so many water bodies are existing, it's a very, very big question mark. Extremely big question mark. I just give you one example. There are so many reservoirs. Whether these reservoirs hold water to their full capacity is a question mark. Because of the silt accumulation, the capacity of the, all the reservoirs have been uh, are reducing. In fact, metro reservoirs capacity is reduced by one third because of the silt accumulation. Tamil Nadu with a geographical area of 130 lakh hectares of uh, uh, 130 lakh hectares is ranked 11th in size among the Indian states. So basically, all that I'm trying to say is that you know, Tamil Nadu is in a very very uh, you know disadvantageous situation in a very uh, you know in a dangerous situation in terms of water availability but at the same time our economic activity is booming we are contributing something like you know uh, 10 to 12 percent of the country's gdp which means we are using quite a lot of water don't forget so much the, the gdp is so high which, which also means that you are contributing you are using quite a lot of water to, uh, uh, to, to, to all the commercial, industrial, and agricultural activity. Now, this is about uh, the, uh, the, um, the Tamil Nadu's uh, water situation. Now, we are discussing the water in the state, but in a context. What is the context? The context is the following. One, the competitive politics, competitive populism, and competitive markets. These things are, this statement, it, it does exist. And secondly, the whole economy, the polity, and society center around growth and development. We need bigger growth. We, we want a better growth model. We want to achieve 8% growth, 10% growth, 12% growth. We would like to exceed Karnataka. We would like to exceed uh, Maharashtra. We would like to exceed Gujarat. We want to have a better, better growth conditions, better growth model. We want to have a better, better growth conditions and so on. So this is what I would call the competitive growth threat. India as a whole competes with other countries. But is just a state like Tamil Nadu will compete with other states. So we would like to be at the forefront. We would like to really establish more in your economic activity and in your growth and your GDP contribution, therefore, which means you are going to use more water, which means you are going to use more natural resources. Is it available to you? That's a question mark. Therefore, the net result, if you look at it, there is rapid urban expansion. Cities are expanding unendingly. And there is massive industrialization uncontrolled rural urban migration. Lots of people are migrating and in the process rural poverty is converted into urban poverty. You will see that urban slums are really a, a, a expanding. There is enormous rise in the demand for land uh, and fast diminishing urban space. There is a fast diminishing urban space. In fact, uh, Dr. Tirupagar when he talks about the disaster management issues, they, you, will, you, will, you will see that this is one of the most important, the, the, uh, important issues. The urban space is diminishing. Urban space, there is a huge demand for urban space, but there is no space available. There is a dense density of population is very high. What is the density of population today in Chennai? In, in, in 2011, it used to be 25,000 per square kilometer. Today, it is 34,000 per square kilometer. Look at the density of population, which means urban space is decreasing, which also means the per capita drainage space is declining rapidly which is also one of the main contributing factors for the urban flood. Anyway, now there is a, there is a mechanical and unscientific land use. Land use is one, uh, urban, land, uh, urban planning, urban land use planning is one of the most important issues that we all should be concerned because uh, land is extremely scarce. But what kind of urban planning do we have? Is it scientific based on some uh, you know, vision, mission? I don't know. I mean, this is something which we have to talk about. We have lost three-fourths of the dense forest in the Western Ghats. This is called the green economy. Forests are extremely important. But three-fourths of the dense forest in the Western Ghats is vanished, is gone. In fact, uh, unfortunately, even the tape, tea, area under tea plantation, coffee, coffee plantation, are all calculated while calculating the area under forest. It is becoming so bad. So three-fourths of the dense forest is the Madhav Gadgil report. And what does it mean? We are losing the water tower of South India. This is the, the this is the, this is a place for, we, where you got all major South Indian rivers are originating like Kaveri, Krishna, and so on, Tamraparani, Vaigai. These rivers are going to become dry because 
the western ghats is disappearing the this forest is disappearing which is also going to result in loss of huge loss of biodiversity most important that is uncontrolled waste generation and plus all key natural resources such as forest land small water bodies estuaries um, brackish water lakes creeks mangrove forest ground uh, and so on and uh, plus there is a groundwater depletion there is loss of soil moisture and uh, and so on now all these are actually going to become a serious issue and all these are also going to become uh, you know contribute to the uh, the loss of biodiversity on the whole the we are heading also towards biodiversity crisis now what's the absurdity the absurdity is that that is the impact of unsustainable growth and development we are talking about the growth and development the big question mark is is this sustainable that is why is the title what are the pathways for sustainability so the absurdity is that that's the, that's the, the that's the unsustainability the growth and development definitely we know that it is unsustainable many 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 forums un organization un secretary general has made the very very important point that please make sure that your growth and development and your gdp are maintainable if you cannot maintain your growth and development that is not good for the economy so but then many many, many international forums these, these statements have been made but unfortunately it is not it with the result our blue economy is stressed and our green economy is stressed now what do we do increasing acidity pollution levels in the ocean segments of oceans are now declared dead zone do you know the segments of oceans are declared as dead zone we are destroying our rivers rivers disappear river courses are disappearing there are uh, rivers are changing its courses and the streams are disappearing tanks and other small water bodies are disappearing and millions of acres of dense forest disappear there is a loss of biodiversity heading towards biodiversity crisis and oxygen depletion in the atmosphere heading towards atmospheric collapse the earth is warming up very fast climate is changing sea level is sea level, sea level rise is increasing and and uh, we are reaching the tipping point we are reaching the tipping point as per the ipcc sixth assessment report only it to ensure that the damages that we had done to the biosphere and to the planet earth is irreversible that is what is called tipping point we are reaching the tipping point very soon pretty soon we are going to reach the tipping point once you reach the tipping point your damage is done we can now talk about do the the the, the climate mitigation measures and so on after reaching the tipping point no more climate mitigation measures going to be very helpful we are heading towards that so we have to be very careful now let us see what all have we lost or in the process of losing them in the particular context of tamil nadu i will rush now we have got wetlands tanks small water bodies and uh, these are the es essential ecological units look at this map seriously this is only an example this is applicable for the entire state this is actually put up put away in, in recorded in the gis and every point can be measured these are the water bodies located in the three adjoining districts of tiruvallur kanjipuram and chengalpattu districts you see so many water bodies exist so many water bodies so the number of water bodies exists 3662 as per the original tank memoirs now do they exist we are lost this just this is just an example if you do it if you do this excessive for the entire state the picture is the same look at this map the same three districts this is a drainage map this drainage map will clearly tell you that how the water was flowing from where to where and what are the links what are the canals what are the streams what are the uh, you know the major rivers micro drains micro drains all these are mapped but do they exist today we complain about the flood so we lost so many floods we lost all this drainage system and then we complain about the flood now tell me is it good to talk about the flood without touching about these issues it's unfair you have to talk about this first before talking about the flood now this is another picture which we will which will be very useful in fact for mma no this is a situation you look at it from 1930 onwards up to 2010 you will see that uh, you know the uh, pink line is actually uh, was a, a groundwater curve groundwater was the lowest end in 1930 it was, it was at the minimal people are not using groundwater at all primarily they were using the tank water and the surface water you see that over a period of time the tank water has come down drastically on the other hand groundwater has gone up quite quite steadily and now it is reaching the peak today 65 to 70 percent of the water that is used in agriculture is from groundwater it is the only groundwater which is used for agriculture production primarily 65 to 70 percent 
either uh, something like 80% of the drinking water in the country and so also in the state comes from groundwater and primarily industrial water comes from groundwater now groundwater is going to become the primary source it is the primary source to which is contributing to our gdp so if there is going to be groundwater depletion my friend professor elango is here is an expert in groundwater he will tell you he is we are heading towards over exploitation depletion and also it's going to result in desertification once that happens if the economy groundwater economy collapses your gdp and your growth and development everything will collapse are we doing a taking any adequate measures to recharge groundwater but you are talking about flood you are talking about excess water you are talking about more water you are also talking about drought we will talk about both but this is where we really have to do very scientific policy intervention interventions now just to give you the again another example of the kaveri delta particularly in the context of climate change look at this map you see that kaveri delta is very very clearly is located on the low elevation coastal zone which means which means thermometer and below most parts of delta including uh, nagapattanam and thiruvaru district these districts fall under low elevation coastal zone particularly the nagapattanam district if you look at the pink the pink area and the green and uh, orange they are 5 meters and below and uh, several villages something like we have measured something like a, 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 something like a 82 villages along the coast are lying in the a, 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 a extreme low elevation zone of 3 meters and below so in the course of uh, already lots of land we have lost through erosion and so, so on and uh, and uh, and uh, there is going to be and this is the nrsa data natural remote sensing data if we compare these two, two, two figures you will see that uh, the uh, on the left hand side you got the area which was uh, it was land now it is it has gone under sea the again nrsa data you will see the major parts of the area in uh, nagur region has gone under the sea and again you will see that uh, another graph which shows again area going under the sea and uh, this is another area this is all in nagapattanam district no if you really look at very carefully i have i have measured 242 points from pichavaram to uh, vedaranam area we have measured that region and we have mapped it and clearly we have lost 4000 acres 4000 acres of it, it the survey number subdivision lie in the sea and the accretion was only 1500 acres the, the, the erosion is much much larger and then the estimates show that given the sea level rise of something like you know 2 uh, cm 2 mm per year based on that if you really do the calculation in the course of next 20 to 25 years most parts of nagapattanam district is quite likely to go under the sea given the fact that there is erosion given the fact that there is uh, you know the already coastal flooding nuisance flooding is taking place and given the fact that there is you know up coastal uh, uh, storm surges are taking place and then uh, given the fact that there is a uh, sea level rise the nagapattam district is going to be extremely vulnerable i just want to also give you another idea about what is going to uh, what is happening in the in the and uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the pollution side if you look at the kaveri river the major tributaries are bhavani noyel amravati kodaganar and kalingrayan all these rivers you got something like um, and, and uh, 9900 small medium industries are located in this kaveri basin and you see the kind of a pollution load they are generating and they are they are directly going into the rivers like uh, the bhavani near erod and look at the colorful water effluent generated and uh, all these are joining the kaveri and finally it all this reach uh, the delta region and uh, these uh, these are just a very very small pictures very very you know, very very you know it's a tiny uh, segment i'm showing but then by and large amravati river bhavani river kodaganar are all very heavily polluted and this is the pallikanya marshland you all know which is which is in chennai originally its area is 54 square kilometers reduced to now uh, 5.4 square square kilometers this is how it is we have lost it and uh, thanks to uh, the declaration that uh, this is this will be part of the it corridor and today unfortunately this pallikanya marsh the value of the pallikanya marsh and the ecosystem valuation is incalculable and my friend um, uh, my, my farmer uh, chief engineer gandhimadanan is sir he will tell you what is the surplus of a uh, upstream tanks which was really uh, getting deposited in the pallikanya marsh you see that kind of uh, you know the, the formation of the wetland 
is something unique, extremely unique, and uh, unfortunately we are lost. And uh, the, 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 this kind of wetland is uh, something which you, you, you can never create. You can construct any number of buildings, but not the wetland. And again, the Polar River. Polar River is considered, as per the Blacksmith Institute, Institute located in New York, is the fourth most polluted river in the world. The fourth most polluted river in the world, thanks to 33,000 crores of foreign exchange we are, we are generating from the leather exports. And you have lost the river. It's a poisoned river. Something like a 22 kilograms of cyanide is going to the polar bed every, uh, uh, every month. And the, as per the study carried out by the Asian Development Bank. So the river is in very bad shape and, and, uh, and uh, most of the streams and uh, spring channels and uh, water bodies like tanks I mean, carry nothing but um, the polluted water. Even the groundwater is so heavily polluted. You can see the water is available at the ground level. Not a drop of water can be used because, because of the pollution load. This is Palar Anikat where the pollutants are there. Again, uh, if this is uh, Noel River. Noel River again is so heavily polluted. And uh, because of the text, uh, um, um, textile industry, network, uh, network industry and so on, dying bleaching. And now, what do we need? We need growth and development. But have we ever talked about greening our national accounts? Have we ever talked about environmental accounting? We don't do that at all. We take environment for granted, but it is the high time that we do calculate what are the damages that we have done, what are the ecosystem damages we've done. So therefore, we have to really talk about the environmental accounting. So GDP cannot be gross. It has to be really net, net of what we have lost to our natural capital. One day then you really arrive at the correct GDP. That's what we should really look for. So that's what is all about in environmental accounting. So the latest uh, IPCC report, IPCC is really, you know, warning us and, uh, and they say that, look, the, the, we have made all our conservative estimates in the fifth and fourth assessment report. Today we are telling you it's in a very dangerous situation and uh, uh, the projected increase in temperature is going to be not 1.5, it's going to be 3.5 degrees Celsius to 4.5 degree, degree Celsius in the course of uh, the uh, 21st century, which is really alarming. I can't tell you how alarming it is. Terrible. Now, there are many key takeaways uh, from the uh, assessment report. I think please go through that and it, it is uh, 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 very important. Uh, but very important information they give is we need today 1.7 years to maintain our standard of living. But we have only one earth. Earth has lost its regenerating capacity. And, um, and anyway, now for the first time, Assessment report, sixth assessment report, the IPCC, for the first time, they mentioned in five places in Chennai specifically. This is the news. This is a 3,700 page report. Assessment report six is running to 3,700 pages. In the 3,700 pages, they have mentioned, cautioned Chennai specifically. They mentioned Chennai's name in five places. I given the page number also. Please go through it, then they will know. They have warned you. This is going to become a very dangerous situation. It's going to be submergence. There are going to be lots of problems. It's going to be like a coastal problem. Flooding is going to become a serious issue. There are going to be all kinds of uh, uh, you know, monsoon related issues. And therefore, they warn you really to take care. Now, water futures and pathways towards sustainable development. It is in our hands. What are we going to do? The result of whatever recommendation that we make depends upon the key stakeholders how they it depends upon them and how they behave who are the key stakeholders the key stakeholders are the governments the markets and the people these are the three important stakeholders governments markets and people more so when i say people more so upper and uh, upper middle and rich who are the primary consumers and primary movers of growth and development if these upper middle and rich people are not there if they don't consume there's going to be no, no, no growth and development. So they are the primary movers. They're, therefore, uh, these three stakeholders have to really act swiftly. And one last word, let's not hide behind climate change for all our blunders. Because we, we commit so many blunders, you see a lot of inundations, lots of floods everywhere, but let's not hide behind climate change. Even with a, a 50 millimeters of rainfall, even with a one, one uh, to two hours of rainfall, you see the streets, streets are flooded. And no, no point in blaming climate change for that. So that's all I'm saying. So let's not hide behind climate change. Mother Earth is bleeding. We need today 1.7 Earths to sustain the current level of consumption. 
and india need india has, has only 0.7 earth india needs only 0.7 earth but then the global global level we need 1.7 but unfortunately the rich hide behind the poor the richer countries in fact if you want to really maintain the standard of living of what us is uh, doing we need four earths if what uh, you know australia is uh, consuming we need something like a seven earths but then if you really maintain what india does you need only 7.7 earths if you really maintain what east and west africa consume you need only 0.4 earth so then you see the inequality there is a climate injustice this is what we need to talk about and you will know that this is the picture showing the uh, losing for forest and western guards and then we need to act extremely swiftly we have no time left and no point in talking about in isolation and micro issues talk about globally bigger issues connected with our larger issues thank you very much sir thank you dr general rajan for that comprehensive piece as always now i invite dr tripugar to deliver his uh, talk after that we will have the q and a what is mainstreaming if you have been studying development literature the way i have been studying for nearly 35 years the simple and straightforward answer can be it is the latest development jargon very interestingly we have been hearing about mainstreaming mainstreaming many things and one among them is mainstreaming disaster risk reduction there is something called development jargon detector that is a tool to trace how this development jargons have changed over a period of time i traced how development jargons have changed over a period of 30 35 years i have listed them here bottom up empowerment grassroots social capital sustainability top down gender sensitive and now currently what is in vogue is mainstreaming these jargons change after every 3 4 years we don't achieve anything but the jargons have to change because new projects have to be written new funding has to be sought so we change the jargon so the latest jargon is mainstreaming why i am saying it is the latest jargon it has not been properly understood with reference to my field disaster risk reduction it has not been properly understood or interpreted either by policy makers or practitioners what exactly is mainstreaming what should we do if you go to google and search for mainstreaming disaster risk reduction google throws up 15 lakh entries 15 lakh and you go and search there's so much of literature so much has been written about it. un agencies ngos government documents so many seminars workshops but it is not telling you what is the problem what exactly it has been done what was packaged as disaster risk management is packaged now as mainstreaming what was earlier 
packaged as something else, it is being recycled as mainstreaming. Why? What is the problem? What is mainstreaming? How to go about it? There are two approaches to disaster risk reduction. One is mainstreaming, the other is not site streaming, it is special projects. What is the difference between two? One is not opposed to the other. It is not that we can stop all the special projects and start mainstreaming disaster risk reduction. That is how it is being talked about in the entire literature, but it cannot be done that way. I will explain why. Special projects. What are special projects? Today, we find that in the year 2021, Chennai was flooded, severely affected in 105 places, let us say. We have to reduce the impact of floods in 22, 24, 25, in subsequent years, in these 105 specific places. So you frame, formulate, you come out with a new project, a special project, to look at reduction of flooding, taking up some mitigation measures in this select 105 places. This is the special approach. So the risk is existing there. You want to reduce the existing risk, you have to have special projects. At the same time, we need to stop accumulation of new risk, creation of new risk. For that purpose, you have to mainstream, which means the further development which is taking place, maybe 7 o'clock from today, should ensure that we do not create any new risk. For that, development should incorporate disaster risk reduction principles. Our development should be risk informed. It should be risk sensitive. So they are not two opposing approaches. We need both together. This is not very much discussed anywhere so clearly. Till now, we have only been looking at special projects. We have not seriously implemented disaster risk reduction through mainstreaming. How this concept itself developed? Earlier, we spoke about disaster resilient communities. The original meaning of the word resilience is the ability to bounce back. If a society or community is affected by a disaster, they will be able to bounce back immediately. That is now disaster resilience is used in a totally different way. Disaster resilient communities. Then the idea was why should the community be affected by disasters and then they should bounce back. Can we not build the capacity of the communities in such a way that they resist disasters. So disaster resistant communities. The third is why should we resist the disaster. Can we mitigate the hazards. Sustainable hazard mitigation. Finally, the latest is invulnerable development. Can we have development in such a way that there is no vulnerability? That is now that is the word now we are using resilient. The original meaning of the word resilience has been changed. Now we are talking about disaster resilient infrastructure, infrastructure which really means invulnerable, which cannot be affected by disasters. How do you define mainstreaming? The simplest definition which I have given here is mainstreaming the internalization of risk awareness and incorporation of risk reduction measures into the overall policies and programs within and outside the government. One is risk informed planning policies and implementation. Second is while doing it, one is planning, the other is implementation. Both should be risk informed. The other aspect is within and outside the government. In creation of massive infrastructure, government should look at it and individuals should look at it even if they build a single story masonry house. So it should be mainstreamed within and outside the government as well. But this is what is happening now. Disaster management is going on one side and development is on the other side. The departments who are implementing development they don't bother about the disaster risk, neither the upstream risk, which the project itself will be facing, itself would be facing, or the downstream risk, which the project will be generating. If disaster managers interfere and say that you are increasing, accumulating disaster risk or creating risk, modify this project or drop this project, 
they will be really looked at as enemies by development sector. The departments will look at these disaster managers as enemies of development. On the other hand, disaster managers are afraid of allowing any development because they are very sure that this development is going to be a vulnerable development. It will carry a lot of risk. So there is no point in developing further. <coughs> what, what is really mainstreaming then? Mainstreaming should have this bicycle model <coughs> where if development is one wheel, the front wheel, disaster risk reduction should be the rear wheel and both should move together. Then only actual development, real development, invulnerable development, which will take place. <coughs> Why is mainstreaming important for us in India? India is one of the most hazard prone countries in the world. We are among the top five countries. In one year, we may be in the third position. <coughs> in another year, we may be in the fourth position. But certainly, we are among the top five countries. Mainly because of our ge geography. 60% of our land mass is susceptible to earthquake. 12% for floods. 68% for drought. Our 7,600 kilometers long coastline makes us prone to cyclones as well as tsunami. We have the risk of chemical, industrial and nuclear disasters and a host of other disasters, mainly because 12 of our states are ill states in the north and northeast. The other factor is increasing number of catastrophic disasters. Scientists are debating whether the actual number of, free, actual number of disasters are increasing due to climate change. Some are saying yes, some are saying no. But what everybody agrees is that catastrophic disasters are increasing. The impact is more and more. Other is we have new types of disasters. Let's take the example of urban floods. Before 40 years, we didn't hear about urban floods. And the latest is cloud bus. Past 10 years, we have been hearing a lot about cloud bus. So new disasters are emerging. And the number of people affected are increasing and economic classes are increasing. We have been able to reduce the loss of lives in India, even at the global level, but economic loss is increasing. Climate change impact, all of you know this, so I don't want to elaborate on this. A new category of risk is emerging. We call it global catastrophes. I do not know whether you have heard about the eruption of Tambola volcano in Indonesia in 1815. When Tambola erupted, the ashes were thrown up in the sky as far as 45 kilometers. It clouded and blocked the sun. Earth did not receive sun's rays for one year. The year 1816 is called the year without summer. As a result of that, agriculture failed all over the world. There was famine in India, there was famine in Ireland, famine in England, food shortage in America. Everybody suffered. Today, we have a different type of global catastrophes emerging. If there is a nuclear war, scientists are saying that there is a possibility of nuclear winter, which will block the sun's rays for five years. The food stock we have will not last for more than three years. If it exceeds three years, if it is five years or six years, what will we eat? They say that we have to cut down trees and we have to eat them. They have to start eating bacteria. We have to start eating many other things. It may be another volcanic eruption or a novel pathogen, a new type of virus. Anything can create this. There is an institute, fully dedicated institute working for this. Then the setback in development. Actually, if you look at the disaster affected places, it is like one step forward and two steps backward. If a place is affected by disasters, then 50 or 25 or even 100 years of development, if it is an earthquake, is totally wiped out. That place will take another 25, 30 years to come back to normal life. So sit back in development and our development itself is currently risk prone. For all these reasons, we have to mainstream disaster risk reduction. We normally talk about four phases of disaster management, prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, which consists of rescue, relief and recovery. If we mainstream disaster risk reduction, 
prevention and mitigation can be automatically taken care of for future disasters. And when there is a major disaster like tsunami, we went for a post-disaster reconstruction in Tamil Nadu. If one had to undertake such a big reconstruction program, we can ensure that we build back better, which means that we take into account future risk and build back better in such a way that the place is not affected by future disasters. If you want to understand mainstreaming, you have to understand what risk means, disaster risk means. It is a function of hazard, vulnerability, exposure and capacity. It is normally said as risk is equal to hazard into vulnerability into exposure by capacity. But more precise way of putting it is, it is a function of hazard, vulnerability, exposure and capacity. As far as hazard is concerned, we have natural and man-made hazards. I don't agree that there are man-made and natural disasters. I am of the opinion that all disasters are man-made. Hazards can be natural and man-made. So as far as natural hazards are concerned, we can't do anything about it. You can't decide whether the wind will blow at a speed of 150 kilometers or 200 kilometers. But in the case of man-made disasters, you can always decide where you can locate a chemical factory. In a thinly populated area or a thickly populated area, you can reduce the hazard by your decisions. As far as exposure is concerned, you can plan in such a way, restrict in such a way, that the population and the area exposed to disasters are exposed to hazards is reduced. One of the main reasons for exposure is concentration of assets and people. So if you can reduce that, you can reduce exposure. Next is vulnerability. Vulnerability means weakness. There are several types of vulnerabilities. We have to understand each of them if we want to mainstream. Vulnerability of the built environment. Despite the fact that we have specific building codes for building in the hazard prone areas, we are not following it. As a result of which, 80% of our built environment is vulnerable to disasters. And poverty is one of the reasons why people are vulnerable to disasters. Poverty cannot be equated to vulnerability. Poverty is one of the important factors contributing to vulnerability. And then we have social, economic, political and cultural factors contributing to vulnerability. Social factors. Some sociologists are of the opinion that disaster is a social construct. It is not a natural thing. It is the way we have created the society which creates disasters because the same disaster affects two people in two different ways. It affects a billionaire differently than a poor man. One is impacted, completely destroyed, the other is not at all affected. So the caste, class, race, gender divisions in the society and handicapped people are also socially vulnerable, aged people are socially vulnerable. So these sort of social vulnerabilities, economic factors, people without sustainable livelihoods are impacted more. Political vulnerabilities, when people do not have voice, they are more affected. That's the difference between dictatorial regimes and democratic regimes. And cultural factors, something we have been doing for 2000 years. It was okay before 2000 years. It is certainly not okay. One classic example is the shifting cultivation which is being followed in the Northeast. It was okay before many years. Today, if you burn down the forest and start cultivating, already the rainfall in those areas is reducing now. Chirapunji is no longer the highest rain receiving place in the world. Not only that, you create additional disasters. Forest fires result when you burn down for the sake of cultivation. Other factors are population, economic processes. If you are having a factory and if you let out more black smoke, the mode of production is creating vulnerability, marginalization, economic marginalization, social marginalization. In addition to that, geographical marginalization. Look at who is staying near the areas which are in the margins. They are the vulnerable people, underdevelopment, unplanned development, and the last factor is very, very important, lack of regulation and enforcement. One is having the regulation, the other is not enforcing it. I will give you an example. In the urban areas, we have regulation 
which mandates people to follow the building codes, the national building code, when they construct buildings. In the urban areas, the bylaws of the municipal bodies clearly say that the national building code should be followed. But it is not followed, we are not monitoring, nobody is inspecting, it is not ensured. If you go to the rural areas, village panchayats do not have building bylaws. So there is no regulation at all. So who is going to enforce it? So both ways, we have regulation, we don't enforce it. In many places, we don't have regulation. When you look at capacity, we don't have financial capacity, human resources, or technical capacity. If we have all the three, then we don't have managerial capacity. Before mainstreaming, before understanding or discussing mainstreaming in depth, we have to understand the disaster management framework in India. Till 1960s, 70s, our focus was on post-disaster relief. Disasters happen and then you give relief to the people in the aftermath of disasters. The whole thing emerged in 1880s when India suffered from massive famines. British Raj set up the first famine commission in 1880. And we had only relief manuals till very recently. The concept of disaster management plans, plans is about only 20 to 25 years old. Only relief manuals governed relief administration. It covered mainly droughts, flood and cyclones. And strangely, disaster management does not figure as a subject in any of the three lists of the constitution. It is not in the union list, it is not in the state list, it is not in the concurrent list. You can ask, then why is it the state governments are made responsible? Many will not know this answer. The reason is, though British Raj set up this 1880 famine commission at the central government level, in 1930s when the provincial administration evolved, this subject was pushed to the provincial governments. So today, the legacy is still on the state governments and they are doing relief administration. It is not there in the constitution in any of the list. And as I told you, famine was the biggest disaster. So agriculture ministry at the central government was in charge of disaster management till 2001. But three major disasters which occurred in 90s, 1993 Latur earthquake, 1999 super cyclone in Varisa, and 2001 earthquake in Gujarat showed the administration that and we were not suffering from famines after 80s in a very, very big way. We had severe droughts, but not famines. The immediate response became important. So this portfolio of disaster management, except drought, was shifted to Ministry of Agriculture and uh, Ministry of uh, Home Affairs in 2001. We have this National Crisis Management Committee headed by the Cabinet Secretary. In 2005, Disaster Management Act was passed and we created three new institutions. NDMA's National, MDMA, National Disaster Management Authority, SDMA, State Disaster Management Authority, DDMA, District Disaster Management Authority. We do not have any provision to declare anything as a disaster in the Act. In the National Act, there is no way of declaring an event as a disaster. It doesn't say that if this, this, this happens, you can declare it as a disaster. It doesn't say. And more importantly, there is no provision for declaring anything as a national disaster. Only our newspapers, our political leaders declare something as a national disaster. But legally, you cannot declare something as a national disaster. And disaster risk reduction has to be undertaken by all the ministries and all the departments in Government of India. Here at the state government level, all the departments should undertake. We will see why I have narrated all these things, what is the relevance of all these things for a disaster risk reduction and mainstreaming. Why mainstreaming is not taking place, we should understand. First of all, we are viewing disasters as isolated events. Development is taking place. Once in five years or ten years, there is a disaster, there is a disruption. Again, we start developing. Again, after five or ten years, there is another disaster. So, we are prone to viewing disasters as isolated events. But they are not isolated events. The manifestation of risk may be an isolated event. You have been accumulating risk for 50, 20, 40 years and that is manifesting. But risk manifestation 
does not mean that it is an isolated event. Since we think that it is an isolated event, during normal times we don't analyze it at all. Once the flood is over, nobody is going to talk about flood till the next flood occurs. In the last 10 years, how many articles you would have read about tsunami? How many people would have spoken about tsunami resistant construction? How many people would have talk, uh, spoken about growing mangroves as protection from tsunamis? Nobody speaks about it. Only when the next tsunami occurs, hopefully after another thousand years, we will all talk about tsunami. So normal times, nobody bothers about it. And we always seek solutions in technology. If there is a disaster, we never look at the root causes. If there is a flooding problem, we think more drainage will help or more pumping out water will help. We always look at technological solutions, not look at the root causes. And it is seen as a temporary administrative failure. If there is a poor reservoir management, if more water is let out in the last minute, if many people suffer, if areas are submerged, it is seen as an administrative failure. So we will catch hold of the chief engineer and issue him a charge sheet or punish a couple of deputy engineers and everybody is happy. That is what is demanded also. The chief engineer's mistake or the minister's mistake, or chief secretary's mistake, somebody's mistake, so take action. It is not that. It is not administrative failure. It is the failure of our development process. We have to understand that. And this terminology natural disaster helps. The moment you say it is a natural disaster, you can be absolved of all responsibility. 50 years of what you have done, you can escape saying that it is nature which has to be blamed. We are not responsible. And when it comes to people's participation, we treat people as victims only. Always the views are from top down. Our approach has been reactive. After the disaster, we are good in saving the lives of people and providing relief. That is how life loss has come down. And our objective is always return to the situation before the event. People, government, everybody wants to go back to the pre-disaster situation. We don't wait for incorporating disaster risk reduction measures in the recovery process. We have to change our perspective from dominant perspective. What is the change which is required? We should understand that disasters arise from the very process of development. So disaster risk reduction should become part of the normal process of development. We should analyze linkages during normal times. Normal times, if a city is expanding, we are bothered about how much FSI we will get, whether we will get facilities here, access to train, access to buses. Who is bothered about disaster risk during normal times? So that should be done during normal times. And we should emphasize on solutions that change the relationships and attitudes in the society. That is the root cause of the problem. A poor man getting affected is the outcome that is visibly seen. Why is a man so poor? Why he has to build on the flood plains? Why he has to build near the solid waste dumps? What is the fundamental cause? Why in the genders, two genders, there is so much of difference? Why women are affected in all the disaster? So unless we change the relationships and attitudes in the society, disaster risk reduction is not possible. And if you want to change the attitude, mainstreaming has to take place. We have to look at people as partners. I will only cover important points. Proactive risk reduction approach. This is also very important. See, we wait, we wait for the disasters to happen. We wait for the risks to be exposed. We never look at the underlying risks. If, the, if you are proactive, you, you will not only look at the exposed risk, you will also look at the underlying risk. In 2009, India's national policy was approved by the cabinet. It clearly says mainstreaming of DRR in the development agenda of all existing and new development programs and projects. So in 2009, the policy clearly said that. The National Disaster Management Plan, which was prepared, the first ever plan in the country was prepared by me in 2016. I revised the plan in 2019. I prepared the revised plan in which I clearly included a chapter, full chapter on mainstreaming. And every department and state government and district, they are mandated to prepare a disaster management plan. And these disaster management plans 
and the development plans of each department and overall state and the ministries should talk to each other and they should be integrated. Then only mainstreaming can take place. In order to achieve mainstreaming, we have to increase the awareness at all levels. Professor Janagarajan raised a question here. Oh, sorry, mm. Mr. Satyamurthy raised a question. It is we who go and buy at vulnerable places. But the problem here is there is asymmetry of knowledge. The knowledge a builder has, the knowledge a planner has, we do not know. So how will you bridge this gap in the symmetry and bring symmetry of knowledge? Unless we increase the awareness at all levels, at the level of common people also, we need risk sensitive and informed planning. We have to have proper land use planning. We have to look at the hazards and plan our development process accordingly. And we have to focus on risk transfer and the risk sharing. Now risk is shared by the individual and partly by the government. But it should be shared globally through insurance and lee insurance. And we need inclusive disaster risk reduction. All those people who are vulnerable should be taken care of. And we need proper institutional arrangements. Existing ones, we need to relook at them. And we need disaster impact assessment like social impact assessment and environmental impact assessment. We have to have a relook at our legal framework and enforcement. And we need, to, we need to have intra-government and intergovernmental integration. So what one department is doing, the other department doesn't know that should not exist. How will you do it? From philosophy, we have to come to practice. One is, as I said earlier, analyze linkages during normal times. See, if you have prepared a district disaster management plan, which talks about the hazard risks and vulnerabilities, and clearly identifies what should be done for prevention and what should be done for mitigation. These projects which are included in that list should become part of the projects or works planned for Nariga workers. As simple as that. So Nariga works should address drought mitigation and flood mitigation. Then only mainstreaming can take place. We have numerous poverty alleviation schemes. They should look at what is creating vulnerability for the poor people. And then our program should address that. And we should emphasize on solutions that change the relationship. I spoke about it. DRR is part of the regular schemes. When you are building houses for the poor under social housing schemes, can we ensure that it is not built in the hazardous and vulnerable places? It incorporates all the disaster resistant features. Now, if you, if you go and see, this is my own experience. In most of the places, the social housing schemes are built in the low-lying areas, vulnerable areas. If there is a flood, they are first affected. So can we ensure that? That's how you mainstream disaster risk reduction. Focus on sustainable livelihood. So giving livelihood and sustainable livelihood are two different things. If there is a disaster, a person having livelihood, normal livelihood will be affected. Vulnerability during normal times is different from vulnerability in the aftermath of a disaster. That is what is called as consequent vulnerability. A person may be yearning well, but if there is a disaster which will affect his livelihood, then he will become vulnerable. The need is to diversify livelihood options. Can we look at that? I said earlier that there is a need for reviewing institutional arrangements. We, in our enthusiasm, created special bodies, special purpose vehicles. National Disaster Management Authority, State Disaster Management Authority, District Disaster Management Authority to guide the departments to undertake disaster risk reduction activities, to supervise, monitor, come out with policy. But after 17 years, the experience tells us the departments are trying to more and more wash off their hands in disaster, responsibility of disaster risk reduction. And they are saying that now NDMA is there, they should do it. That's why this body is created. Now SDMA is there, they should do all disaster risk reduction activities. We will keep creating risk and they have to do disaster risk reduction activities. So the very purpose of mainstreaming and emphasis on mainstreaming has been defeated. If my own idea is that if mainstreaming really takes place in 15 years or 20 years or 25 years, then we need not have these special purpose vehicles. Why do we need special purpose vehicles if 
mainstreaming takes place through the respective departments, line departments. If you look at the sustainable development goals, you can see that how disaster risk reduction is part or should become part of our development. The goal number one is there are 17 goals where disaster risk reduction and development overlaps. End poverty in all its forms everywhere. Promote sustainable agriculture. Ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all. Promote sustained, inclusive, sustainable economic, economic growth, full and productive employment and decent work for all. Build resilient infrastructure. Promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. Make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. Take urgent action to combat climate change and its impact. So almost all these goals are nothing but which talks about mainstreaming disaster risk reduction or invulnerable development. So unless we mainstream disaster risk reduction in each and every scheme, in each and every policy, and each and every new program, we will not be able to mainstream. Then what about the site streaming or special projects? We have to have these special projects for many years running parallel to mainstreaming disaster risk reduction. Because the existing risk, if I say 80% of our buildings are vulnerable to earthquakes or 30% of our buildings are vulnerable to floods, they are existing buildings. You cannot mainstream and reduce disaster risk in those buildings. So you have to have special projects for them. Special projects are needed. It is like relay race. Two runners, before they exchange the batons, they have to run together for some time. So this side streaming and mainstreaming, they have to go hand in hand for some time, maybe for 15 years or 20 years or 25 years. And then if we start implementing mainstreaming today, at least after 15, 20 years, we can have full-fledged mainstreaming. That is my idea of uh, disaster risk reduction and mainstreaming. Development can reduce vulnerability our development can increase vulnerability. So it is in our hands. If we mainstream today, we can have invulnerable development. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that educative presentation. Because this is one of the rarely discussed topic in the public fora. And now we have running short of time. Still, we will try to take one or two questions. And just no opinion, only questions. Mention the speaker to whom the question is addressed. And keep your questions sweet and short. Anybody? Mention your name, sir. My name is Chora Natshayar. President of the Tamil Chamber of Commerce, 80 old, 80 years old organization. Thank you for this meeting and uh, the presentation by the two top speakers. My question is, particularly to the Chennai city, sir, is there any scientifically, practically, technologically feasibility for cleaning the Kuom, Bakimkam and Adayar River for navigation and to stop the drainage and make permanent solution to the water issues. We, CAA, FIKI and other organizations, Tamil Nadu chapter and our own Chamber of Commerce for two decades having so many seminars about this. Is there really a possibility, technologically, scientifically, practically, to clean that river to navigable after these developments? That is my question for the two speakers. Well, uh, if you really look back into the condition of Thames River in the 18th century and also the beginning of the 19th century, 
ఇట్ వాస్ మచ్ వర్డ్స్ అండ్ కోమ్ అంటే అడిగారు ఆల్ ఫీకల్ మ్యాటర్స్ ఆర్ ఫ్లోటింగ్ థేమ్స్ ఆర్ ఫుల్ ఆఫ్ ఫీకల్ మ్యాటర్ నౌ ఇట్ ఇస్ క్లీన్ సో థేమ్స్ కెన్ బి క్లీన్ వై నాట్ అడయర్ కోమ్ అండ్ బక్యామ్ కెనాల్ ది ఫస్ట్ అండ్ ఫోర్మోస్ట్ థింగ్ దట్ వీ నీడ్ టు అటెండ్ టు ఈస్ వై దీస్ రివర్స్ ఆర్ నౌ స్టింకింగ్ వై ది రివర్స్ ఆర్ అన్క్లీన్ వై డ్యూ రేజ్ దిస్ క్వశ్చన్ నాట్ ఆల్ వై డ్యూ వై డ్యూ హ్యావ్ దిస్ డౌట్ బికాస్ ఇఫ్ యూ రియలీ అండర్స్టాండ్ ది రీజన్స్ ఫార్ ది స్టింకింగ్ నేచర్ ఆఫ్ దిస్ అర్బన్ రివర్స్ యూ విల్ నో దట్ ఇట్ ఈస్ బికాస్ ఆఫ్ పీపుల్ వీ ఆర్ రెస్పాన్సిబుల్ ఫర్ ఇట్ completely we are responsible for it we in the sense it is our sewage it's our garbage which are floating in the adyar and kom river and the moment you stop the sewage generation and the sewage mixing in the urban rivers the river is going to be clean can we do that why is that we, we we are not able to do that there are 793 outfalls into the kom river alone can we plug it why is that we are not able to plug it and so also in adaya river adaya river more than 790 outfalls joining the river plus all other sewage that we generate the truck loads are uh, you know dumped into the bakyam canal and kom river we, we are responsible for it so we really have to uh, ask ourselves why is this happening why is that we are unable to plug these outfalls the sewage outfalls industrial uh, pollution outfalls into the uh, river the moment you stop it the river will become clean the river has got a fantastic capacity to rejuvenate itself it will rejuvenate itself in one big monsoon season if you stop the pollution next question sir what do you see what you said is absolutely correct you asked one question whether it is scientifically technologically practically possible possible and probable are two different things you must understand that but the question is it is scientifically possible it is practically possible it is technologically possible the question is is it politically possible that is the ultimate question because you said you have been talking about for two decades which mean for so many governments came and went isn't it so the question is that i have answered your question uh sir the, the session has been the session has been quite educative our eyes our eyes have been open uh sir uh, in uh, uh, said that you know this uh, rain related disaster uh, the, the starting point to start to avoid such disasters is right forecasting weather forecasting uh, please give us your views on our weather forecasting particularly in the context of the failure of imd the indian meteorological department last 5 6 years 7 years i can relate so many instances when they failed miserably and as a result we had disasters even the one we had on okay, first second december, december 2015 plus on third 12 13 november 2022 yeah, can you identify yourself i am jayaraj i retired as a general manager from steel authority of india limited and i am in madras the last 25 26 years see it's very easy to say it's a failure of imd if you look at the history of disasters in india there are so many instances where imd's forecast was accurate still the disaster could not be averted for various other reasons there are so many disasters where imd exactly forecasted the landfall much better than nasa and much 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 better than other sites and people's life could be saved if the total number of deaths and disasters in india has come down it is mainly due to the forecast of imd and all our death reduction is mainly death reduction in cyclones in 19 let me complete in 1999 orissa since orissa super cyclone more than 10000 people died a cyclone of the same severity came in 2013 it's called filin only 22 people died in 2014 we had hudhud only 50 people died the recent cyclones you take cyclones in the last 10 years 
the deaths are minimal it is because of the forecast there are certain scientific in every country it happens it is not that it doesn't happen in other countries if you look at what happened in puerto rico in cyclone mariam in 2017 3000 people are missing even today they are not able to account whether they are dead or whether they are alive they have much more superior forecasting systems it is not true that imd's forecast is poor it is constantly improving weather systems are not highly predictable it suddenly the system changes for example the cyclone oki within 24 hours from low pressure it graduated to a super cyclone within 24 hours it doesn't happen like that so we have to give imd also it maybe they have not been able to predict in certain places making a sweeping statement how many disaster statistics do you have where they accurately predicted where they have accurate until non predicted so let's not make sweeping statements let me just add one sentence and uh, uh, mr raman all of us in chennai you know once he while he was addressing us he mentioned one thing it is very difficult to predict a cyclone or weather patterns in uh, tropical areas in countries like india it is not like uh, us or something like that here it keep changing so that is uh, one of the major reasons imd or anyone else handling these things in the indian conditions will find it difficult last question my name is kartikeyan uh, one question to professor uh, kartikeyan one question to professor uh, janakarajan uh, what would you recommend as action items for the common public like us apart from those uh, items you mentioned for corporates and governing bodies what would as a common public i need to do to address these issues no for for what issue to address what to address the flood issue or to address what climate. okay climate change okay okay now uh, in the recent times in fact uh, you know uh, uh, the the ipcc sixth assessment assessment report in the report in fact uh, the scientists were exp- expressing anguish you know why there so many scientists uh, 192 scientists from all over the world and much more scientists are working and uh, they are presenting their results and they were also saying that what's the point in our expressing these views that we are expressing our uh, publishing or scientific paper there are no takers so what they are saying is that the common man and the governments and uh, other stakeholders are not really interested they only meet once in a way in the cop meetings what they call the conference of parties meeting once in a year the last meeting was held in glasgow and they meet get together and then we just uh, disperse so nothing happens they really they are really unhappy about that they were making sort of uh, you know uh, uh, unofficial ca- comments and statements like this the fact of the matter is that the climate is changing okay it's not a fiction anymore and scientists are very vigorous about it they are talk- talking about it and unfortunately the governments the key stakeholders the governments the markets and the people including you and me we don't take it seriously so in fact in fact i've been in the recent times talking about can we resort to some sort of climate outreach programs how to take it to the common man unless every every person every industry every stakeholder talk about it and then unless they take it seriously it is going to be really uh, you know uh, uh, not not very useful so in that context it is very important that every individual every manufacturing unit and uh, uh, every government should act together and then come to some kind of a consensus to have and have a program scientific program and a program to practice in a sustainable sustainable fashion it's not going to be very very possible so particularly for a common man i would say when you consume because the consumption is the main driver main driver of growth and development which again that contributes to you know the greenhouse gas emissions and so on every consumption should be responsible consumption when you buy think twice before you consume is it worth consuming do i need it and similarly similarly when you throw a garbage use and throw you have to really remember you are using and throwing who is there to catch it this is this kind of attitude 
behavioral change and attitudinal change which will contribute positively you know uh, for, for for combating climate change otherwise we will never be talking about it and uh, we will 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 we'll, we'll end up in problem so so not only in consumption and also in the use of key natural resources in every one of our activity we have to be very careful and we need to really put this across to the students young children and school students college students everybody everybody should get together and climate change as an issue should be talk of the matter at, at, at all levels thank you mr thank you mr speaker i now invite dr venkatram uh, sorry group captain dr venkatram thank you thank you so much sir it's been a very very enlightening session as uh, some of the audience said sorry it's just the uh, you know we are running very much behind the schedule so uh, we are forced to stop it and interact it offline so uh, there are about 325 uh, viewers online the four or five questions i have got maybe just to satisfy them i will take one question uh, maybe one of them uh, dr janak rajan maybe you could take it a very very simple question mr vasantan from pondicherry is saying sir ro waste so much of water at homes and in so many offices industries everywhere uh, but use of ro seems to be necessary is it possible to get clean water so that so much water can be saved without use of ro actually you know the w- water use efficiency is something which which we all have to you know think about it very carefully uh, very often we really worry when we don't get water when we get abundant water we don't uh, you know uh, when 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 we we worry when we don't get water we don't worry when again when we get abundant water and our attitude again should change we should be very careful about in using the water and and be in, in using the water efficiently and this is why you know i would again advocate what is called the water literacy program every every individual from child onwards and up to the grown up person they should be very careful in about using the water and the very word of the 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 waste waste water generation i mean i don't agree with that at all no no water is waste so you really have to think twice before using the water and then is there any way to recycle the water at home you can recycle the water in industry you can recycle the water Uh, and and every and at uh, and every sector we can recycle the water i think that is need of the world if we, if you don't recycle the water if you're going to use water and keep generating the used water and then that's going to become a menace so that is what we should really look at and this is what this is a kind of a water literacy program that we should impart at all levels again thank you thank you doctor uh, so ladies and gentlemen i think all of us will agree we had a very very informative and enlightening session and uh, Uh, Dr. Tirupugar also spoke about this mainstreaming, a new word and a new concept. I think most of us uh, learned today. And Mr. Satyamurthy, as usual, has uh, uh, been phenomenal in arranging uh, this for us this evening, collaborating with MMA. So it is our delight uh, and our duty to honor uh, the guest speakers of the day. My request, Mr. Satyamurthy, to hand over a small memento from uh, our end, from both the organizations. So my request, Dr. Tirupugar and uh, Dr. Janak Rajan to accept a small um, a token of uh, memento from our end. Thank you sir both of you are so well read so we thought we'll give you some more books to read so thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for joining us this evening and uh, get back home safe um, have a great uh, evening uh, until we meet again thank you so much all of you